Um, I am here to introduce Carol Malstead from Project Resilience, who will introduce our main event. Thank you. Come on, Carol. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, and thank you so much for being here. You know, this is our first. Project Resilience has run an educational parent workshop series for, what, I think about 10 years. But we haven't met in person for two years. So thank you for coming. Everything we've been doing is on Zoom. So this is really great. And it's nice to see so many people. Um, this talk is one of a, one of a year-long series entitled Raising the Selfie Generation Instilling Resilience and is sponsored by Project Resilience. <laughs> I'll stand away. Um, it's sponsored by Project Resilience, Richfield Public Schools, Richfield PTAs, Richfield Library, Richfield Youth Commission, and Books on the Common. We thank them for their partnership. With no further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Katie Takayasu and Dr. Susan Lasky. Dr. Katie Takayasu is an integrative medicine physician, author of Plants First, a physician's guide to wellness through a plant-forward diet. And the books are in the back. We'll be selling them uh, when this is over. They're $35, we take credit cards or, of course, cash. She's a speaker in the holistic health space, bridging the gap between traditional Western medicine and the evidence-based complementary health tools of nutrition, acupuncture, meditation, botanicals, and lifestyle optimization. She works one-on-one -on -one helping patients to recognize their own innate wisdom for finding balance in the mind, body, and spirit, and in group settings with a gentle but effective Dr. Katie Detox, a jump start for reclaiming wellness and lifestyle balance by harnessing the body's natural wisdom for detoxification. It's available in five and 10 day guided resets. She loves being with other people who bring her joy, so you have to be joyful tonight, <laughs> especially her husband and two sons. You can learn more about Dr. Katie's Life Kitchen at www.drkatie.com, on Instagram at Dr. Katie or in her New Canaan, Connecticut practice. Dr. Susan Lasky is a general pediatrician at Stanford Health who loves taking care of all children and adolescents and supporting families through the ages of birth to 21 years. She's also spoken for Project Resilience, I think, on two or three occasions, and we're very grateful to Dr. Lasky for her help and support over the years. She volunteers and gives lectures in the Richfield Public Schools, has spoken for Project Resilience several times, and helps support families of children with food allergies through a company called Backstop. As a food allergy mom, this is one of her passions. She also teaches first aid to local Girl Scout troops. Dr. Lasky prides herself on the relationships she builds with families and believes in getting to know the entire family unit, which is an integral part of taking care of a child. Her goal is to foster an environment in which the child feels secure and comfortable and even looks forward to checkups. She firmly believes that a partnership with parents and open dialogue are crucial to having a working relationship built on trust. She lives in Richfield and has two daughters in high school. She enjoys traveling, cooking, reading, and running, but most of all, spending time with her husband and daughters. So let's welcome Dr. Lasky and Dr. Takiyasu. And this woman brings me a lot of joy. We had we had the occasion to meet through a mutual doctor friend a couple, I don't know, it was probably like eight years ago. I was pretty young in my practice, and we had made an occasion to go out to lunch. And I knew after just meeting her for 30 minutes um, or 45 minutes for lunch that I definitely needed to somehow convince her to be my child, my children's pediatrician. And so I've gotten to know her at our annual visits over the last um, you know, several years. And thankfully, my kids are pretty healthy. Um, but but my, it's really true. They really look forward to seeing you on a regular basis, which is, I think, pretty remarkable for a kid and a pediatrician. So I hand it to you. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, I think uh, that's a, the way we met is actually a funny story because when we went out for lunch that day, I actually didn't bring my wallet by accident, <laughs> and so, um, which is a very embarrassing first meeting with someone. And so um, I also knew how special she was when she didn't even blink when I was like, I swear I didn't do this on purpose. <laughs> I have no money. Um, and um, you know, it's just awesome to be 
here doing this with you and being together. We both like to keep this really casual and have it be an open discussion, an open conversation, um, and are just really glad to be in person. It's kind of strange, right, to, to be sitting here with an audience. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It reminds me of, of what used to be and what I hope we get back to because it's the social connection that ultimately I think is probably the most important to me, but also in studies is like the thing that you know, really breeds like the longest lifespan, really. It's, it's social connection to other humans. So welcome back. Well, thank you for coming out. <laughs> I know there's a lot of other things going on in town tonight. I hear you know, there's a big sports meeting at the high school, and there's a big event at, at um, the Playhouse. So we really appreciate you guys making the effort to come here and hear us speak. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, sort of just to kind of kick things off, I think it's important to understand what we're going to talk about tonight. And the scope honestly can be literally about anything you want it to be. We're also here to answer questions and, and sort of just talk openly, uh, have an open dialogue about what nutrition means and what it means in our lives as adults, but also for our young people. Um, and I think one of the, I didn't realize you were a food allergy mom, which also makes me love you more, because uh, that's a really tough territory to navigate. Um, and so I, I mean, actually think we should maybe talk food allergies too a little bit too. We haven't really discussed that, but that's yeah, kind of the whole thing. Yeah, which is a big passion of mine. Uh, and we can definitely talk about how to navigate healthy foods with food allergies and keeping the diets, you know, in part, you know, safe and healthy in different settings and different scenarios. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll just kick it off and just tell you kind of how the book got to be, because everyone, I mean, if you're, if you're not like in the writing field, sometimes it's a little bit of a curiosity, like, well, how, how does one actually publish a book? Well, so it started because it was COVID, right? And what is anybody else doing during COVID? Nothing. And I got, um, I'm on Instagram, and so people, uh, a book publishing company found me on Instagram, you know, this is the miracle of social media, and they had said, like, we're specifically looking for a physician who knows something about nutrition to write a book, a plant-forward book on nutrition. And I thought, well, I can do that. Um, and what was really important to me when I wrote the book initially was um, not just really to talk about nutrition, but also the other three pillars of like really good, well-rounded lifestyle. So nourishment is just one of the pieces, and it's a say. And so it came out pretty fast. But every time that I got frustrated, I would use my mantra, which was, I'm a doctor, not a writer. I'm a doctor, not a writer. And I would go down into the kitchen, and I would cook, because that's what we were all doing during COVID. We were all cooking. And part of the task of the book was to also write, to write 40 or more recipes. And so every time that I went down to the kitchen and I made something, and my little boys, who are nine-year-old twins, every time that they would eat it, and they'd be like, this isn't so bad, I'd say, winner, and it would get written down that night while we were watching TV, and then it would, and then eventually got into the book. So the, the book um, is not just about nourishment and about like my philosophy on nutrition, but it's also meant to be like a practical guide for people to use in their own kitchens who want to live a more plant-forward life. And so that's kind of how the book came to be. That's pretty amazing. Um, so we have some questions. Should we sure. go through those? Let's yeah. do them. Um, I'm going to use my glasses, which I didn't know I needed until somebody that I work with told me I needed them. Um, <laughs> um, so how does inflammation in the body work? And is it true that different foods can cause inflammation? So a big part of the book is, is talking about why someone should do a plant-forward diet. And a plant-forward diet, in my mind, really comes down to one reason, and it's really inflammation. Um, and I think that, you know, if you drill down to the, I think you would probably agree with on so many levels and so many different, um, you know, diseases, if you really drill down to, like, what's actually happening in the body, it really comes down to non-productive inflammation. Um, and I think, you know, we had talked about maybe doing a, a, a sort of intro on inflammation. Is it all good? Is it all bad? And inflammation really isn't all bad. We need inflammation in the body, and we see this all the time with acute injury. So if you sprain your ankle and you come in to see one of us, probably not me, probably Dr. Lasky, your kid comes in with, with a sprained ankle, you might see swelling, you might see redness, you would see pain. Um, and all these are signs of like acute inflammation and you need that in your body. You need like 
the inflammation that happens when you get stung by a bee. Um, because that's what actually helps your body recover. And our immune systems are so smart and so beautiful and they know exactly what to do in the acute setting. But then what happens after you know so many weeks, months, years, the body is still trying to sort of fix things and it sends out different chemical messengers. And those different chemical messengers are not helpful anymore. And they actually cause um, chronic inflammation. And it's the chronic inflammation that really is what we think to be the systemic, bless you, the systemic root of all, um, really all illness. And so you mean look at the commonalities amongst obesity and um, high blood pressure and high cholesterol and cancer and like all the things that are really taking us out these days. If, it, if you really drill down to it, what is the change? It's inflammation. So my charge in the book really is that if you want to decrease inflammation, one way is to consider having um, a more plant-forward lifestyle. And when I say plant-forward, I don't mean, I don't mean plant only but um, this idea of like prioritizing things in the right amounts. And I think this is where we can really have a good conversation because you probably see a lot of people, kids, young girls, who are starting to like sort of stonewall foods and saying like this is a good food, this is a clean food, this is a bad food. And so um, I'm a really big believer in that all foods are fine in the right amounts. I mean, what do you see in your... What do you see in your practice? I mean, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, a lot of people get stuck in ideas about food, too, and stubborn in ideas about food, mm -hmm. about what is a good food, what is a bad food, um, but also just what I like and what I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to have flexibility in the way we see things. And one of the things I say to my patients is, you know, you change as you grow, right? Like when you're two, you play with different toys than when you play with when you're five, than when you, the things you want to do when you're 12. And the same thing actually happens with food along the way, mm -hmm. right? You change in the things you like and that you don't like. We just get stubborn about not trying new things sometimes because we think we didn't like them the last time we tried it four years ago when our mother put peas on our plate, right? Um, but if you try stuff, um, a lot of times you surprise yourself and you actually like it. And specifically with young girls, I agree with you that um, they get stuck in ideas of healthy, not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and in most things in life, it's all about moderation, right? It's all about having a balance. I think if you're too restrictive and they're not allowed to have any sort of, quote, fun foods, mm -hmm. then when they're not in your sight, all they're going to eat is fun foods. Um, and right, they're going to shove candy in their pockets and cookies in their pockets. So it's a balance of, and I think really teaching children what they're eating so that they know if they're eating something healthy versus something a little less healthy, and they're making a conscious choice mm -hmm. so that if I ate these cookies or I had a big piece of cake, maybe I won't have dessert after dinner tonight. And it's just about a mindset around healthy lifestyle. Oh, 100%. I do also want to tell you that my children are not perfect, and when we were on vacation recently, I definitely went back to my hotel room and heard one of them on with the um, room service asking for a delivery of four Snickers bars. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I can't believe you're wasting this, these people's time. <laughs> so they like their sweets too. Because kids are hardwired for sweets. Literally, they kids don't have an upper threshold of like what is too sweet. Like if I gave you, say, a piece of cake and put extra sugar on it, at some point in time you would just be like, oh my gosh, like this is so sweet, I can't even stand it, right? And you would just push it away. And a kid just, just really doesn't have that upper threshold of, of sweet they will just continue to eat more sweets. So part of the education at my house with my boys has been about, well, how does that food make you feel? And they recognize, I think after all this time, they really do recognize that like when they do eat sugar, and like, you know, whatever, they eat sugar and it's fine, um, but that, you know, 30 minutes later, they're asking for something else because the sugar didn't satisfy what the brain actually wanted because our brains are not hungry for calories. They're hungry for nutrients. And so the best way to really start to think about food is like, what's a nutrient-dense food? What's a real food? That's a fun game to play with kids, actually. It's just like, what's a real food and what's not? I mean, at you know nine, my kids are pretty hip to that game. But when they were four or five, it was actually really fun That's to sort of say to them, like, you know, are the broccoli sticks real? Or like those cauliflower sticks? Or is cauliflower real? 
they put cauliflowers for your mom. <laughs> uh, but, but that's really where the nutrition lies, right? So that's where you get all your B vitamins and your iron and your magnesium and like all the things that you need to grow. Um, and so I could always appeal to their ability and desire to like grow up and like, be strong and be healthy um, from a strength perspective by talking about food sort of that way. Yeah. But that's boys. And girls are a little bit different, I think, too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for with young children, I often tell my patients to play games with them where, you know, I, I tell my, my patients when they're in the office, you know, you have to eat all the colors of the rainbow in fruits and vegetables to grow, right? That's how you grow. And when you get a rainbow in your belly, you grow like magic when you're sleeping. And so I have them play a game where I say, you know, make, literally paint a rainbow with your mom or your dad, and I want you to hang it in your kitchen not like somewhere obscure, right? Where you eat, it should be hanging. And then every day I want you to pick a healthy food of, of each color of the rainbow. So once, you know, every day you pick a different color and then I tell them that they grow a white magic mm -hmm. and that's how uh, they, and when they come in to see me for their checkup, I'll often be like, what rainbow colors did you eat? And then they tell me, I had raspberries after last game, I liked them, or I had red peppers and they were really good. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really important thing when they're little. I think the other thing is adolescent kids often have natural cravings for a lot of junk food. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's normal, um, but needs to be reined in, right? Because they will often eat an entire bag of potato chips or, um, and so I think talking more about health than about body types mm -hmm. with girls um, and with kids in general, um, and since you mentioned girls, I think it becomes very important about healthy foods rather than this is a bad food or this food will make you look fat or you're going to gain weight from this food. There's so many girls already, just because of the way our society is, have ideas about their image or their body or their body type compared to their friends. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, the language actually is very important, even from when they're little. Um, and we tend to speak to boys and girls differently, actually, even without realizing it. So it's something to be conscientious of, as, of the language we use. Um, but to teach them healthy, less healthy, mm -hmm. right? This is fun food. This is brain food, right? This is growth food, brain food. This is kind of fun food. And like one of the things we used to do in my house was have, we would have dessert twice a week. I just said to them, you know, because it became all of a sudden every night we needed something something sweet. And I said to them, you pick the night, you pick what you want, you can have whatever you want. So it wasn't dictated to them, um, and they got that choice, and it became less of a kind of constant battle because they got to pick when they ate it and what they ate. I agree. I think giving kids choice, like ultimately that's what we all want in life is agency. And when we give kids a little bit of agency, they tend to actually exercise it pretty, um, pretty responsibly um, and do it in a way that actually feels like really, that feels really good in their bodies. Um, but you know, as far as like food aversions, because I know we had talked a little bit about addressing like picky eaters, because that seems to be a really big problem, not only amongst children, but also amongst adults. Um, is trying to figure out like if you've got a food aversion or, you know, say a food allergy, like how do you troubleshoot around that? Um, and one thing I'd really love to share is that, you know, it probably took me over the course of time, I bet 12 or 13 tries to get my kids to eat salmon um, to the point where like when I gave it to them, they didn't like automatically push it away. And mostly it's little Oliver. He's, he's a little, he's a stickler, that one. Well, I can usually appeal to one of my sons by, you know, he has such an adventurous palate. I bet you'll really like this. Um, the other one, he, he likes his, he likes everything just, the, just so. And, um, and when he finally said, like, okay, like, I'll eat, I'll eat the salmon, um, it had been probably 12 or 13 times that I had served it to them. And now it's sort of just this thing that's accepted on our plates um, at dinner time. But I think it, it kind of, re it reminds me that, like, we have to be persistent as parents. And we have to be sort of persistent, but also, like, understanding. And so like this, the portions might be very small at first for something that's new. And you say, you just have to taste it. You don't have to like it, you just have to sort of taste it, at least at my house. And that seemed to like at least just expand that, that palate or that understanding that this flavor exists, right? Because kids don't naturally want like bitter foods and those kinds of things. 
But I even had to do that with myself. Like now I really like tempeh, and there's actually a really nice recipe in the cookbook for, um, for a BLT sort of alternative sandwich where the, where the, the bacon is replaced by a marinated tempeh. I know people, it's a, it's, a far, it's a far cry from real bacon. I've heard on so many accounts from so many people. But it's an approximation. Plants are not animals, so they, they will never taste like animals, but, um, but you can sort of approximate some of the flavors. But tempeh is a really beautiful food because it is soy-based, so it's a complete protein. And so it's got all the essential amino acids that one would need. And it's also fermented, which is really good to like help your microbiome and help your digestion. Um, and so, but it naturally doesn't have like a very great flavor. So the first time that I ever tasted it, I had no idea what I was supposed to do with it or how it was supposed to taste. And I thought it was awful. Like I literally remember the day I bought it from Fairway back when they still operated in Stanford. And I came home and tried it and I was like, this is terrible. I cannot believe people eat this. But then I, you know, sort of like read a little bit about it and I talked to some people who also made it. So I got some ideas of what I might do to it. But I still think it probably took me six times of trying it before I could sort of say like, oh, okay, like maybe I like this. And now, no joke, I love it. And so it just takes a long time, even as adults, to like convince the taste buds to kind of change into like different things. And so if you can imagine, if you're going from like the standard American diet to like a more plant forward diet, like things are gonna be really different and you're gonna have to give yourself some time. Ooh, I like questions along the way, go okay. for it. I grew up without sugar. My mother was really way ahead of her time. And she was like, we was out somewhere and we had a piece of cake. She said, oh, go ahead, try it, you know. And we tried it. And she would try it. Ugh, sickening. That's sweet. <laughs> and so we developed an aversion to sugar. Oh, wow. She did, she took your thing, did it opposite. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sickening. And so none of us eat sugar. Really, to this, to this day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so and interesting. I so. know your thoughts. Now, I'm genetically pre-diabetic, so even when I read sugar, I have to watch carbs. What, can you tell me a little bit about the uh, down the pitfalls of sugar and high carbs? I mean, it's a great question. So just for those um, who might be listening to this um, later, the question really is um, about how to think about sugar and like its impact on our lives, but also um, was influenced by a story um, of being growing up in a, in a household where um, her mom actually um, would taste something very sweet and say like, oh, this is like sickeningly sweet. Like it would sort of, sort of like um, say that, you know, that gave them all sort of an aversion to sugar. Um, and I'm sorry for your genetics. Like you can't, I mean, you don't eat much sugar and yet you still have prediabetes. And that's, that comes straight down to your genetics. You can't choose who your parents are. Like that's just the way, you know, the, the, the good universe made you. Um, so there is some acceptance there um, that, you know, comes with a, a diagnosis like that. But sugar really is ultimately what we're discovering now. And there's a nice chunk of space in the book dedicated to this. The sugar really is ultimately the enemy. We used to think it was fat, and then you know we, we changed. We've had so many different diets over the last like 30 years. I literally have probably been on end all of them. Um, in the book, I share my personal story, but one part of my personal story is that I grew up a pretty chubby kid, and um, and just really sort of dealing with like you know sort of all that comes with not feeling comfortable in your skin. And um, ultimately, I look back now at all the different diets I tried when I was, you know, in the 1990s, and I recognize that all of them were high in sugar. And sugar ultimately is what probably, you know, fed forward the problem. The, d the deal with, with metabolic syndrome, which is that combination of prediabetes or a tendency towards a higher glucose or glucose issues, blood pressure issues, cholesterol issues, um, as well as weight gain, usually around the middle, um, metabolic syndrome is what we call that. The issue with all of that is that in order to sort of, even if you have a genetic tendency toward that to break out of it, you necessarily have to decrease sugar in your diet. But then it's also the sugar that then brings on that, that, that stuff to begin with. So it becomes a very chicken or egg or rock in a hard place position that many you know, sort of find themselves in. And so the question becomes like, well, where do you actually make the intervention? Like, where do you stop this, this boulder from running down the hill and running me over? 
And I find, um, I find that it just starts with like some slow and steady changes, but mostly it comes to fiber. Fiber is your best friend. I say in the book, you know, it, it's the thing that it cleans out your, your blood vessels like a squeegee. It goes through your, um, your gastrointestinal tract like a bristle broom. Like it literally is the thing that keeps everything moving in the body. And the reason it's so beneficial when it comes to sugar specifically is because it balances the blood sugar. And so when you eat something like, say, a handful of Skittles, you have no choice but to have this huge surge of, of sugar in the body and then a corresponding surge of insulin to bring that sugar down, right? But if you have fiber, even just alongside that sugar, so say you ate your Skittles with a handful of almonds, it would be a totally different biochemical story in the body because you have fiber to slow down the absorption of that sugar, and therefore you don't get that big insulin rush. And that ultimately is what prevents people or helps them like manage their weight, manage their blood sugar, and ultimately manage like metabolic syndrome, which is a problem for you know many, many, many Americans. So honestly, the, the answer really, I think, is, is fiber. And I think it's important to just point out also that like a lot of the recent studies have shown how addictive sugar is, right? Like sugar's really addictive. And if you, um, as addictive really in one study as cocaine, right? Which is kind of crazy to think, but you, when you're not eating it, you don't want it anymore. Uh, but when you are eating it, you're constantly craving for more and more and more. Um, which is actually why, truthfully, not to get into the food industry, but why they put sugar in everything, right? So you buy more of their food um, because it's an incredibly addictive uh, item. Yeah, and really, truthfully, much worse than fat. And like, growing up in the 80s and 90s, it was low fat, low fat, low fat, right? And low fat is often high sugar. Yeah. Um, so you also have to know how to read labels, right, of what that means, what low fat, or, you know, they, I, I never had noticed this before, but they even make like, non-fat heavy cream or non-fat and I was like what is that <laughs> um, and like that it's really all replaced with carbohydrates right yeah. and it's basically pouring sugar rather than um, having some you know healthy fats it's a balance with that but some healthy fats in your diet yeah um, can you say can, hi sorry um, do you think a whole or scheme Oh, so yeah, her question is about dairy specifically and if, um, if it's better to have whole versus um, skim. I personally think whole milk dairy tastes a whole lot better, um, and so I prioritize in my own life real dairy and a small amount of it over eating more of something that's low fat or skim. Um, and then also, again, it comes back down to like, what's the nutritional sort of like balance on the body? So if you can imagine like a breakfast where like my kids' breakfast this morning was whole milk, yogurt, full fat. And on top of that, um, I actually have a batch of Celebration Granola, which is in the cookbook, which is a beautiful, like very, very um, nut forward granola. So it's got a good you know, sort of amount of fat and protein to it. And then they, um, we put some like, you know, different berries on it. And then of course, like a, a tiny little spoonful of my grandma's like strawberry jam, just, just to make it interesting enough for the little guys. But that sort of nutritional balance in my mind is like, here's the protein, here's the fat, and here's your carbohydrate. Like it's all together in one. It's about the fiber, the fat, the protein in every meal, plus the flavor, of course. That sort of helps manage the blood sugar. And that might be a whole different biochemical story than something like a skim yogurt that would be served with just fruit, right? Because that would be almost all sort of carbohydrate, maybe a little bit of protein, but almost all carbohydrate. So a little different, even calorie for calorie. So that's, that's my bias. What do you, I mean, I know there are a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff out there about teenagers and girls and menstruation and full fat dairy and like all that stuff too. Yeah, I mean, I, th I agree with you. I also think a lot of like the diet or low fat stuff also tends to have either fake sugar in it, right? Um, sugar substitutes um, or just a lot more sugar mm -hmm. in it for flavor because it loses its flavor when it loses its fat. Yeah. Um, so I think I agree with you. I think the full fat in moderation is probably better um, and probably healthier. Um, you know, in terms of dairy versus non-dairy, I think there's also a lot of uh, false stuff about dairy out there. I mean, it is an inflammatory food, and you shouldn't probably have tons of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there's a lot of dairy substitutes now, and a lot of people ask me about not giving their children any more milk, right? Instead of milk, they want to give their babies oat milk or um, coconut milk or almond milk. Uh, and I think it's a little bit of a slippery slope, because again, a lot of that stuff is super processed, and I think it depends on what you're buying, the quality of what you're buying. A lot of that stuff has a lot of added sugar in it as well. Um, so if you're buying sugar-free things, I think it's obviously better. Um, but still, I think for young children under the age of two, um, full-fat milk is probably the best mm -hmm. and the only studied food. They need a lot of fat for their brain growth and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I find a lot of young children past age two and teenagers don't have a lot of dairy because they're kind of growing up in a dairy-free time. It's a different culture. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Except for ice cream. Yeah, because it's delicious. Except for ice cream. Yeah, even my, even, my, even my children who were both allergic to dairy for a long time and never really developed a lot, a lot of taste for dairy, but they still like ice cream. It's true. Yeah. But you know, in my mind, like fermented dairy um, is, is a little bit of a different story. So like, that's why I feel a little more comfortable giving my kids like, you know, full fat cow yogurt is because it's fermented. Um, and fermentation helps to make it more, um, a little bit more easily digested and also gives us natural probiotics. But just recognize if you're, you know, whatever sort of source you're getting, say a probiotic or your, you know, your natural dairy from, um, you know, you, you end up building a microbiome to support the digestion of like whatever you're sort of used to eating. So say if, if you're eating a very like dairy, very heavy diet, that's going to sort of tell your microbiome to sort of like sort of populate itself in a certain way. And if you eat a very, very, say, you know, all plant diet for that matter, like you were a vegan eater, that would encourage your, you know, your, your population to go a different direction. So if you end up starting to change things in your diet and you notice like little digestive things happening, it's just because your microbiome hasn't really had a chance to sort of accommodate to that. So don't dismay if you end up sort of ditching the cow yogurt and you choose coconut yogurt, for example, and you notice like a little digestive something, you know, give your body a little bit of time to sort of figure it out. And the same thing goes if you start to increase plants specifically because there's just so much fiber in them. Um, you can't really expect your microbiome and your body to really accommodate overnight. And so some of the stuff that I've read um, as far as like trying to make some transitions in the diet have been like not to increase like if you were going to increase beans, say, in your diet, not to have more than two one-half cup servings in a week because you just can't literally shift things that fast. So it's really slow and steady change, you know, makes every race. That's what I always say. Um, so we just want to make always slow and steady changes in the diet. Um, and so likewise, if you were going to sort of curb ice cream amongst kids, you wouldn't want to go cold turkey, but you just want to sort of help them understand portion control. Um, and like what a, what a normal size of ice cream is, right? It's not these huge ice cream cones um, that we normally get, but it's like, you know, a half cup or a cup or so of ice cream is like a normal amount to have. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so how do we encourage teenagers to eat more plants, more veggies? Because now that stuff, what they like, you know, or the fake out food, or the, you know, junk stuff at the restaurant, and like, you know, mom's, Food, no, mom's home cooked food is no longer good. It doesn't taste <laughs> as good as all the takeouts. I, um, I the, her question is about how to encourage more plants in our cooking. Um, and Susie is a really good um, cook. I'm a, I'm a home cook also. We've had a lot of conversations just about like all the delicious things that we've made in, in our kitchens and cooking with our kids for that matter. So I definitely want to um, I definitely want to hear um, your opinion on this as well. But I honestly, at first, really just tried to sneak vegetables into their diets where they wouldn't really notice them, especially when they were really little. Um, and one of the things that Susie had brought up on our, on our walk over here um, was just like how to start encouraging, encouraging more sort of plants in the diet, even from a young age. So what do you tell parents who are just starting to feed their kids, and then we can kind of work our way up from there. Yeah, so I mean, even even at eight or nine months old, when you're starting to introduce table foods, right, and you've gone from sort of pureed baby foods to table foods, I tell people to feed, feed your baby right off your plate, right? They should be eating what you're eating. They should be eating family food, cooked food, healthy food. 
the baby doesn't know that mac and cheese exists, right? The baby doesn't know there is such a thing as a chicken nugget. So just don't give it to them. Um, I will tell you that, like, I, it was, it was to a point of embarrassment for my kids when they had never had a McDonald's chicken nugget, and they were well beyond the age, and they said to me, my, kid, my friends all have had this, this food called McDonald's, and I, I, I've never had this because, like, I like, we just never stopped for that on the road or or got it. So just feed them what you eat. But in saying that, we have to eat the way we want our children to eat. That's them. exactly it. That's exactly so it. So we have to model for them, like we do in everything else, right? You model behavior for your children. You model how you want them to act in public. How you want them to act at a restaurant. And you have to model how you want them to eat. So if you're a picky eater and you only eat pasta and um, you know carbohydrates, then that's what you're teaching your children to do. So that you have to push yourself outside your comfort zone and eat things that you may be uncomfortable with. And Katie said that it took 13 or 14 times to get her kids to eat salmon. I tell my patients it takes 20 to 30 sometimes for their kids not to make yucky faces. So when you're first spooning peas into their mouth and they're grimacing, that doesn't mean they don't like it. It means it's new. It's a new flavor. They don't mm -hmm. understand the flavor. They've only maybe had formula or breast milk till then. And so keep giving it to them, even if they're spitting it back at you in their face. Just keep scooping it in their mouth. And eventually, they will open their mouth like a little bird and eat their fruits and vegetables. Um, I would also tell you not to be a short order cook. Mm -hmm. it's, it's you cook what you're giving them, and that's what they're offered. And if they don't eat it in this population, they're not going to starve until the next meal. And I think that we feel bad mm -hmm. when they're not satisfied at the end of their meal, and they're crying or they're cranky, and they're saying it wasn't good and they didn't like it. So we feel like we have to satisfy them and make them something else. But the truth is, is my parents didn't do that for me in the 1970s and 80s. I, food was put in front of me, and I either ate it or I didn't, and they're not going to starve, and it's not our job to constantly satisfy our children. You don't miss the dairy, but you also get a chock full of fiber and protein. So there's like, there's little hacks around things. You can use crumbled tofu instead of, or along with your, um, with your ground turkey or your ground beef if you're making something like a bolognese or a taco meat. Like you can find like little ways to just kind of change things up so that if you just start to build it in, they won't really notice. And then over the course of time, again, slow and steady wins every race, you can find that they'll probably adapt to that. So that can be some helpful, helpful stuff. Right, but I mean, this one, this works with the young kids, but once, once they become teenagers, they kind of want to do their own things and eat everything that stays good and junky. So how do we bring them back to the... So one of the <laughs> things I would say is like, in your house, you buy the food, right? And so I would, whatever you have in your house is what they can eat. So I wouldn't buy a lot of junk food for them to have access to when they're home. You're correct. When they're not home, they're going to eat what they eat. Um, and you don't have control over that. And if you've taught them to eat well through their life and you've given them that, you know, guidance, they'll probably swing back to it when they're through these couple of sort of tenuous years. Uh, they'll probably come back to a healthy diet eventually. Um, but I would say, you know, I just wouldn't have a lot of access to junk. One of the other things I say to my older patients is, you know, your, your mom or dad has cooked you a meal and it's taken a tremendous amount of effort and time and money and energy. And it's the same thing as if you painted your mother a picture or made her a clay pot in art class and you handed it to her and she looked at it and said, this is horrible, it's so ugly. I don't want this, I don't want this pot, right? And uh, how bad would you feel if your mom said that to you? And they often acknowledge that, that would be bad, right? That would make me feel, that would hurt my feelings. And I'm like, when you're looking at your parent who's made the effort to cook you a really good meal and you say, this is disgusting, I'm not even gonna taste it, that's just as offensive. And that's their art project, right? And um, the other thing I would say is incorporate he or, um, he or she into helping you cook. Yeah. Because I find when my kids cook 
things and they help create them, they are much more likely to like them and to eat them. And they've cooked with me since they were little, but my kids are currently 15 and 17. And I have them cooking dinner, honestly, once a, once a week. They each cook, a, they each cook dinner. Um, and we pick it out in advance because we need you know, ingredients and things like that. Um, but they're proud of it. They're more likely to eat it. They take it for leftovers sometimes, even for lunch, because I think they're, they're proud of what they've made. And you know, they're not putting chicken nuggets in my um, toaster oven, right? Because that's not what, we're, what, what you're going to buy for them to cook. So I would do some of those tricks, and sometimes that's really helpful. I think that's a great that's a great way to help them um, also like with that agency like to have to help them have choice. I also love it when my kids are like, God, chopping vegetables is like a lot of work. I'm like, oh yeah, it is like a lot of work. It requires actual like you know yeah. muscles to actually like you know to do it all. But I find also in our household the buy-in on dinner is so much different when they know that they've made a piece of it, whatever piece. You know they they may have um, they may have put into it, um, but you're right. Being a teenager is so tough because you think you know everything, but you absolutely know nothing. <laughs> Your hormones are all over the place. You don't know up from down. Like I would never want to be 13 again. I was I'm a really nice person now, but I was totally heinous when I was 13. Um, I was oh it was awful. Um, but, but I think sometimes you can appeal to like satiety or like just this idea of like fullness and like feeling well and having energy to like do the things you want to do sometimes you can appeal to teenagers in in that way but honestly i and i'm on in the preteen sort of spot now and i know what's coming for me you know i lived it once i'm going to live it again um but i think ultimately it's just a couple of years it's not forever it wasn't their entire life and so if there are some you know, bad choices made or just sort of like doesn't feel, you know, all that, you know, great, it's not for forever. It's just, it's a kind of a temporary thing. So that, I, I, I find solace in that too as a parent. And part of them is giving them some freedom and some choice, yeah. right? They do need some choice and even if it's a bad choice, they'll learn to make better choices, hopefully. Um, but we all need to make bad choices sometimes also to learn. So even if they are eating a little more, that's, that's a, okay for a time. Yeah, 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 for a time. Thank you. Yeah. Quick question on protein. Yeah. Um, as pre-diabetics, which many people are, or diabetics, um, I'm all for eating vegetables. I love vegetables, okay? But I have to be careful. I can't, there's a lot of carbs. Yeah. You know, and beans, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that elevates your sugar. So, I'm all for vegetables, can't eat much fruit. Mm -hmm. um, but what's wrong with protein? I mean, what is wrong with having a chicken thigh, organic chicken thigh? I don't see any, yeah, I don't see any problem with protein. So her question is really about managing blood sugar issues um, with, with like animal protein. And I think it's totally, I think it's totally fine. You don't have to feel bad about it at all. Uh, yeah, no, you don't have to feel bad about animal protein. I think, you know, and, and not everybody, you know, everybody, not everybody is meant to love every food. And, and some foods feel better for some people than they do for others. So in your sort of, idiosyncrasy or your, I call it your wellness intuition, like your body says, like, I need a little more protein and a little bit less, you know, of those starchier sort of, even if they are protein sources, you need a little less of those. Okay. But someone else could feel a little bit differently, but that's, that's your sort of experience with it. Um, in my mind, you know, animal stuff is a little bit more inflammatory. It just is. Plants are a, a little bit more anti-inflammatory. If you had to sort of blanketly say that. Um, and in that, though, you know, there are some animal proteins that are more inflammatory. So beef and pork might be more inflammatory. Um, chicken, in my mind, is kind of like a neutral sort of food. Fish is kind of a neutral food. Whereas omega-3 rich fish like salmon, black cod, halibut, sardines, those are anti-inflammatory. So I would really prioritize those in the diet once or twice a week. Um, so their fruit is so much sugar. Yeah, that's, fruit that's can and, yeah, fruit can be fruit can be a problem. You know, I, I meet people instead of saying when I meet someone as a patient and I say like you know how many vegetables and fruits you eat. That's I say that very purposefully, right? It's not fruit and vegetables. It's vegetables and fruit because we probably need a four to one or more ratio of vegetables to fruit in our diets. 
I have a lot of patients who eat, you know, four or five servings of fruit a day and barely eat any vegetables. And the same can be true of kids um, as well. They could be really good fruit eaters because, yeah, it's nature's candy and it's delicious, um, but it's not nearly as good as the vegetables. I actually tell people to introduce vegetables before fruits when they're introducing foods. I, I very much say I want you to give lots of veggies before you give fruits because the fruits are naturally sweet, obviously, and the kids naturally like them, but we want them to eat their green beans and their spinach, and so uh, I, I do that from, yeah. from the get-go. Yeah. But yeah, but it's um, but I, I see a lot of people who are like fruititarians, you know, they, they say they eat really healthy and they just have a ton of fruit over the course of the day. Yeah. So ultimately, it really all comes down to balance, right? And something about that balance didn't suit you very well, right? So when I think about different foods like on my plate, I sort of try to think about different buckets that I'm trying to fill. And the best advice I could, I could give someone who like, you know, wants to do a pretty good job on their plate is actually look at the plate real estate and ask yourself two questions. One, what's on the plate? And actually two, how big is the plate? Sometimes we are used to eating off these, I have these beautiful, like, large dinner plates, but they, I, bet they're, I bet they're 11 or 12 inches in diameter. Whereas I could probably really should be eating off, like, salad-sized plates, which are probably more like 7 or 8 inches in diameter, right? Um, and it's amazing, like, how a salad, an amount, these, they're, everybody's laughing, all the men are laughing, uh, because, you know, Literally, men are like, no, that's a lady portion. I, I need a man portion. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, we should not be eating off smaller hands. Um, but honestly, it's amazing how mind over matter satiating eating off a small plate is. It just makes it like sort of taste like more, even if it actually isn't more. It's really amazing the, the mind tricks our, our minds play with us. So that's the first thing is eat off a smaller plate. And then think about the real estate on the plate. Half of the real estate should be dedicated to bitter vegetables. And I'm not talking about sweet potatoes. I'm talking about like kale and um, cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and like stuff you inherently taste. They could be a little, I actually think like something like broccoli actually has quite an inherent sweetness to it, but it's not a sweet vegetable. So that goes on half the plate. The other half of the plate in my mind gets divided between protein, fat, and then starch if you want it. And so protein might be your, you know, your chicken thigh that's about the size of a deck of cards. It might be a half cup of tempeh that you've, um, that you've made, or maybe it's something, maybe it's something else, but about, you know, about that size. And then a third of that plate is dedicated to fat. And fat's a little bit hard sometimes to quantify because we're cooking with it, we're roasting our vegetables in it. Um, but if you have like a salad, it's pretty easy to say, well, there's my quarter cup avocado, or there's my quarter cup nuts and seeds, or whatever the, the fat might be on that meal. And then the other third of that remaining half would be dedicated to starch. So in the end, at one given meal, you might only have a third to a half cup of starch from a sweet potato, or a regular potato, or a whole grain, or something like that. And maybe for you, if you struggle with weight, or if you have metabolic sort of stuff going on, Maybe that's even less for you. And that's where you start. And then what you do is you listen. You eat that, and then you listen until you eat the next meal to your body and sort of say, what does that feel like in my body? What's my energy like? Do I want to take a nap after this meal, or do I want to go out and play a round of golf? Do I um, crave a lot of sweet after this meal, or do I feel pretty satiated? Do I really want a cup of coffee because I just feel so tired? And then you start to play with the macronutrient, the fiber, fat, protein balance, and figure out what is the magic amount for you. But that's probably where it would start. And it sounds like for you, you, were, you had all amazing good intentions, and I really applaud that. But it sounds like you got the mix wrong, and you got the mix wrong maybe just a little too long. So I'd say start to tweak with it a little bit. Yeah? It's funny that you said that about the plate, because I always have said, I, I serve my family dinner off salad plates, and I always tell my patients, the American dinner plate is huge, mm -hmm. and you tend to fill it, right? You fill it, and then it's sitting in front of you, so you eat it. Mm -hmm. And it's a ridiculous portion. 
Um, and so we've always done salad plates, and I always recommend my patients that they serve dinner on salad plates. Because then if you're going for seconds, right, you're going for a little more of something, it's a little more of something. It's not massively more of something. Because remember, our brain and our gut are not always in sync. So sometimes we don't realize we're full when we've eaten way more than we actually need mm -hmm. until like a half hour after you're done and you're bloated and uncomfortable because you've actually overeaten, but you didn't know it when you were eating, right? So you went for seconds. So if you eat a smaller portion, drink a lot of water, you're more satisfied, right? And then, you know, so salad, I'm all for the salad plate too. I was yeah. water. So I would say my my personal preference is for people to hydrate kind of outside of meals. I think I personally and I you know I, I spend a lot of time listening to my body. That's how I've, I've sort of have come to this conclusion of like how to teach other patients. It's also it's ultimately in like listening to what feels good to us. But what feels good to most people is to um, to drink water mostly outside of meals. And not like in big cups, you know, you, you down like a whole cup at one time, but actually sit throughout the day. And the reason you don't want to drink too much with meals, it is important to have water with a meal because it helps you swallow your food and keeps it from getting dry in your mouth, especially with things like chicken and those kinds of things. But you really want to think about like, well, I have these digestive juices that start with my saliva. Can I actually just chew and masticate this food enough that I can, I can sort of um, start the digestion process? And so that also um, helps not dilute our stomach acid, our stomach, you know, regular um, pancreatic sort of enzymes. And then also helps us ultimately recognize when we are full. So a little bit of water meals for sure. Um, but not, you know, not a, not a ridiculous amount. I remember when I was younger as a weight loss strategy probably trying to drink a lot of water with meals and that just ends up making you feel really bloated. Yeah. So, yeah. I didn't gallons, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. some. Just yeah. some with meals, for sure. Um, I think this might be how long we slated to go. I don't know. We've got time for a few more questions. Okay. A couple more questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, going back to diabetes, pre-diabetes, what would be your advice, let's say, to Yeah, you know, um, prediabetes is a is a huge problem and on, honestly an underdiagnosed one. So I applaud everybody in this audience who knows that they have prediabetes because it means your doctor is doing a really good job. And so next time you see them, you should high five them um, because a lot of people aren't checking the right labs to kind of figure that out. And so often I'll have someone who's you know come from their primary doctor or come from other places or maybe hasn't checked in with their doctor sort of enough, and, and they sort of describe all their symptoms, and I was like, you know, if someone ever talked to you about your blood sugar, like, do you have a blood sugar issue? And they're like, I don't know. Um, and then I look through their labs from the last couple of years, and it's just really never been checked. So really, in, in my opinion, most people should be checked with a hemoglobin A1C, which is the, um, the blood test that looks at your blood sugar over the course of the last three months. It really tells us what percentage of your red blood cells are kind of covered with sugar and gives us more of an, an idea of like what's been happening over the last 90 days after as opposed to just one snapshot in time. I've seen it all the time where people have a normal fasting glucose, they'll get fasting gloves done and they'll see like on their comprehensive metabolic panel that their glucose is fine. Um, and then when we get the A1C back, it's a totally different story. So I would get both of those, both of those tests. Um, and I also think that, you know, we have to be sort of strict about the way that we look at those numbers, um, because you know the I, I've talked to endocrinologists who have said even though like on most lab values it says between 100 and 126 is kind of elevated glucose, and then above 126 is actual diagnosis of diabetes. I have seen this sort of like what happens when people get sort of north of 90 with a fasting glucose. That's when changes are starting to happen. That's when the weight gain sort of starts. That's when they notice like they're not they're just not feeling as well. And so that's when I start to have that conversation of like, well, what's actually happening? And doing a little more lab investigative work to figure out, well, are we kind of catching this before it actually is prediabetes? Um, but prediabetes is, is a huge problem, so I'm glad that you know that it, that problem exists. Um, but the thing is that with prediabetes, I see a whole host, seriously, of young, strapping, very healthy young men who have prediabetes because it's just in their genetic code. And so you have to recognize that like some of it is, is choice and we all have to make good choices in our life, 
but a lot of it is hardwired in us, and, and like I said before, you can't choose who your parents are. Um, so as much as I would want to say that like you, nutrition is super important, it probably is, but it's not the whole story. Some of it is just innately like how you how you were made. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether you can address the question since we're talking about heinous teenagers. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about food and mood? You know, food and anxiety, food and depression. What do you recommend to your patients who are struggling with emotional issues? You know, I was just listening to a podcast this morning when I took my um, when I took my dog out, and it was it was done by a psychiatrist who is more of an integrative psychiatrist, and she was talking about real anxiety versus like fake anxiety. And real anxiety is like anxiety, in her opinion, was anxiety where um, you know it, it doesn't go away with certain circumstances. It's kind of always there. But a lot of us have situational anxiety or situational depression, and a lot of that is influenced by our lifestyle. So this is inherently the kind of anxiety or depression that you get when you don't get enough sleep. And you just know you're going to be anxious that next day and kind of tired but wired and kind of trying to make it through your day. It's what happens when you are, um, you're Dr. Katie and you get stuck on a train over the weekend and the only thing you have in your bag is, is a dark chocolate bar and so you eat the whole thing because you're starving and then you get home and wonder like, why you're jittery and having trouble sort of like putting things together. It's because I had too much sugar and caffeine for me in that moment, right? And so the mood is really so much influenced by what we eat. And so the first thing to ask ourselves, I think, when we have, especially teenagers, we know they're going to struggle with mood a little bit because their hormones are all over the place. But the first thing is to ask them is those four pillars. How are you sleeping? And if they're not sleeping enough at night, it is, there's no way that they can regulate their mood during the day. It is just a virtual impossibility. Um, and I, 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 I'm sure you know the statistic, but it's something like if you shortchange your kid one hour of sleep, their, their uh, developmental level goes down like, like a whole notch, right? Tremendously. And, and just because of the way our society is, like their biology, they want to stay up late, sleep late, right? That's their biological clock. Um, but society doesn't let them do that, right? So they've got to be up and out really early. So they are walking around sleep deprived. And I mean, there was a study um, that showed that being sleep deprived is like being drunk, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't think straight, your cognitive function is delayed, you're blurry, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I always come back to like, how are you sleeping? And then I encourage them also to like move their physical body every day, at least 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and then also then to think about nourishment and like, how is what we're eating making us feel? And just like that chocolate bar um, in the train made me feel jittery and sort of like overstimulated, the same thing can happen if someone eats a bag of Cheetos instead of eating a real meal. So, yeah. I think this will be the very last question. Um, can I ask about young children or like teens um, and school lunch, which you, I think you touched on a little bit earlier. I think it's very influenced, unfortunately, by the food industry. Yeah. And these past few years, Although maybe beneficial to some, but this free lunch has really backfired for me because of my 10 year old son who wants to get it all the time. And I believe what I can make it would be a healthier choice, and yet here he's eating this every day. What would you say is our ability or power as parents to try and affect change somehow the school lunch and perhaps make it less, you know? I think that's a really important point and a really important question, and I totally agree with you that the quality has changed tremendously and, and I and I get why it's being done and I'm for why it's being done. Like everybody deserves good food and I understand that. But um, the quality has changed. I know in Europe actually in a lot of countries they actually cook fresh meals for kids, right? And uh, it is insanely important that they're eating healthily, especially while they're trying to learn, right? And then having to focus after lunch if they've had a really um, unhealthy meals, sugary meals, really difficult probably for the afternoon and having to pay attention. Um, I think it's an incredibly important thing to change. I, I'm not sure how to get it changed, um, but I would be all for trying with you because I actually completely agree. I can tell you what I've always done. Even my high school age kids bring lunch to school, which I don't think is cool or popular. I'm not sure, but um, they've always bought lunch sometimes, and they've always brought lunch most of the time. And I have to say that they choose that now. I don't force them anymore. Like when they were little, 
I packed their lunches for them or had them help me pack their lunches as they got old enough to do it. Um, making choices with them and they were always allowed like, you know, some fun food because um, you don't want to be too controlling. Um, and then they always liked Pizza Fridays, right? Pizza Fridays, they, I would let them do Pizza Fridays. Um, and now that they're 17 and 15, I have to say they can buy lunch every day. They have an account at the high school, but they both bring leftover, leftover food most days. Um, and so I think part of it is giving, again, giving them some control. Like teenage and preteen kids are looking for control. That's why they are constantly battling you about everything. They want to be able to have some say. And they should have some say. So give them some say. <laughs> Just don't give them all the say, I think is, is kind of where I would go with that. In, in terms of the district, I don't know, but I would be glad to talk to you about it. <laughs> well, I want to thank Dr. Katie and Dr. Susan Lasky for um, helping us understand the, the benefits of a plant forward diet. Her book is for sale in the back. It's um, $35 for, she's taking credit cards. Books on the Common was going to be selling the books. They had an emergency. They're also at the Playhouse, so, so we lost out on Books in the Common. But you can also go in and get the book tomorrow, Books on the Common. Okay? But thank you all for coming. Thank you.